You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? Yeah. You're watching <laughs> slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am one of your humble uh, hosts today. Uh, my name is Jimmy Wong. And I'm your other host, Rachel Weeks. Queen of podcasting. I decided that was your title on the yeah, back here today. Yeah. Put, put that on my uh, lower third. Queen of podcast. <laughs> Queen, yeah, with a little crown, too. <laughs> um, so this is a podcast topic that yours truly... Actually, that usually refers to myself, uh, right? Yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, theirs truly. My, my is <laughs> yours truly. Yours truly. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> Came up with... It's a really good one. Uh, it's the scariest commanders to play against. Yeah, I think... Like, over the years, commanders had a lot of different, very scary commanders that sort of stick out. Especially when there were fewer legendary creatures yeah totally and uh, like in the early days it was zur and then mm-hmm. shroom and then yeah. narset what uh, was the one that gained all that life in the oh, command zone brago no 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 no, no brago no. is no, up there brago, by the way. brago's high but uh the other one that i always confuse with brago oh bosh not <laughs> it's not obosh either maybe you can tell us in the comments aloro, aloro there it is we got it's, there I started, it started with an o, o. you yeah, were close uh, like Najila, Turgrid, there's tons of commanders that get printed and the now, commander now. community is terrified. And with the enormous influx of legendary creatures, there's more commanders to be afraid of than ever before. So there isn't like one specific boogeyman anymore. Mm-hmm. There's like a long list of them. <laughs> yeah, and they all are different types of boogeyman in the format. So that is what we're going to discuss today. Mm-hmm. A little bit about how to play against it, what signs to look out for as well. Maybe you can survive your next encounter with them. But before we get into it, let's talk about our sponsor. Monsters, cardkingdom.com slash command. That's the place to go if you want to buy magic products, sealed, singles, anything at all, really. They've got it all at Card Kingdom with a huge warehouse, tons of selection. Every single card you could think of has both the near mint versions all the way down to heavily played. So if you're looking to build a deck on a budget, you can paste in an entire deck list and instantly go and search through all of the options, choose which quality card you want, if you want it in foil or a special edition, and then build that list, click one button and blammo, that deck is on its way way to you in one full selection it's really handy dandy cardkingdom.com slash command it's what i always use to build decks because i really don't like both the paper waste of having like 17 different packages come to my house and have to throw them all away after taking the cards out of course (laughs) so card kingdom both makes that a lot easier they also have an amazing buyback program and so much more check it out cardkingdom.com slash command couldn't recommend it in enough if you just type that in you're on their website and you're supporting the show and getting the cards you need what a great combo Speaking of supporting the show, once you have those cards in your hand, you're going to need to protect them. Go to ultrapro.com slash command for the highest quality magic accessories to protect your collection, mm-hmm. protect your decks, uh, make sure that everything is sorted and uh, so you can find everything and safe. Yeah, I got one of those big plastic sorting bins. That I stores. love those. It, it saved my life. It's a game changer. Yeah. Plus, when you don't sort your cards, you can just leave them sitting in the <laughs> sorter forever. And then you feel good because they're in the organized place. Yeah. <laughs> And they're, they're nice and safe. So make sure you're going to ultrapro.com slash command because they have some of the best deals as well. If you yeah. follow their newsletter, you're always getting on the front line of great sales and making sure that you're getting the best quality products for uh, inexpensive prices. Yeah. They just recently had a 20 to 50% off deal Magic the mm. Gathering Select stuff. So yeah. that, that's uh, pretty good when you're getting 50% off of anything. <laughs> <laughs> the other reason to follow their newsletter is to make sure that you are keeping up with Secret Lair drops. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Because they'll do uh, exclusive drops that sell out really fast and you find out exactly when they're live so you can get the cool products that you want. Again, ultrapro.com slash command. Last way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. We love our patrons. They have access to a Discord that we can answer your questions and directly you can join our amazing, thriving community community there uh and you can also check out the upper and larger tiers of patreon we have merch we've got exclusive videos we have a, a chances to play with us on spell table all sorts of different perks available only at patreon.com slash command zone you are directly supporting the show if you do that and we cannot thank you enough that's how you really pay it forward i think with online internet uh content is by going to people's patrons by supporting their sponsors and it helps us make future content and as a result we get to do this cool thing that we that we do all the time for you all and, and have cool episodes like this and then we also shout out one lucky patron every single episode so this week's episode is dedicated to austin Austin morris Morris. thanks austin thanks austin you rock 
rock, rock, rock. <laughs> All okay. right, let's get into it. We are talking about the scariest commanders across the table from you. When you sit down and you look at the command zone and there's four commanders there, it's the ones that make you go, uh-oh. Yep, yep. <laughs> so there was a, n- a number of different ways to sort of think about how to approach this episode. Originally, I was like, oh, let's do it in the categories. This one's mm-hmm. difficult to interact with. This was a combo deck. This one's insurmountable value. But I think this is actually a more fun way of doing it. So thank you, Rachel, for existing and bringing cooler <laughs> ideas to the table here. So today we're going to break them down by the amount of time that you have to interact with their plan, either by removing their commander or picking off some of their value pieces. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just how much time in turns you can give this commander uh, before they do their thing. Yeah. Like before doing their thing will win the game or you'll die. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little bit of a clock. Uh, so when you're sitting and you see that commander across from you, you know when it comes down, how much time you have to interact, to be ready for them, to protect yourself. Yeah. Uh, and so let's kick things off with the fast ones. These are the one to two turns uh, commanders. So these are like your value commanders. And it takes one to two turns once they show up mm-hmm. to really get going. Maybe even that turn if they have enough mana. But typically it's like they'll cast them. Maybe they're holding some protection up, but by that next turn, things are about to get hairy and they're about to snowball. Yeah, these are the snowballing is the biggest thing about these commanders is they're they're value commanders and the more value value they generate, the more value they generate. So they just get out of control so fast. You probably have a little bit of time before you're actually dead, but you do need to interrupt their plan in some way. Otherwise, they're they're going to outpace you in the game. So, and wreck ya. Yeah, don't get wrecked by value. Uh, so this first one is the king of value, the wizard of value. It's Tulane. Actually, technically a druid. A, the <laughs> druid of value. He's got books and stuff. Yeah. I don't know. There's no animals anywhere on Tulane. <laughs> this is a two, a green, white, and a blue commander. So Bant, five mana total for a two, four human druid with vigilance. And it says, whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card, then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Whoa. And then for whatever reason, it also has the activated ability of pay three mana tap for turn target creature you control to its owner's hand. In case you didn't draw a, a creature, Jimmy, you can return a creature wow. to your hand and draw have another chance to draw. Uh, Tulane is sort of the value commander that... Bar none. It's, it's up there. It's... It's one of those cards that you just know you can't race in terms of value. So right. the first few turns, like they'll cast two lane, maybe cast one creature. That's they'll draw, same turn, they'll yeah. draw a card, they'll play a land. It's a five mana commander. It's pretty expensive. But if you leave two lane alone for that second turn or that third turn, or like you give two lane too much time, they will have more cards and more lands than anyone at the table. Yeah, every single time they play a creature, given that they have cards in their hand, and by the way, they're drawing one, mm-hmm. thanks to Chulain, they're basically rampant growthing, but it's untapped. So they're just going to keep going off and off and off and off. And it, it is compounding effect, right? It's an mm-hmm. exponential effect. You do it once, you get another land. You do it twice, you get another land. And now all of a sudden, you're not just one land ahead of the rest of the table. You're five lands, five creatures, five cards. Yikes. Yeah. The creatures to look out for in a deck like this are the creatures that bounce themselves. They look innocuous on their face, uh, but cr- cards like Shrieking Drake, which is a one mana card that when it comes into play, you can return a creature you control to its hand. Including itself. Including Shrieking Drake. So it's one mana to draw a card and put a land into play, and you return Shrieking Drake into your hand. Yeah. So you can keep generating that value over and over and over again. White Mane Lion is a similar problem. Yep. Yep. And I would also say the thing to watch out for for Chulain are like cards that say, hey, it's time for me to have a 10 to 30 minute turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Panharmonicon is going to double up on anything that comes into the battlefield. And obviously chulain has got a lot of different cards that are probably going to do that. Cloudstone Curio is basically Chulain's second ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll find that Chulain, if they're using that second ability, that's not good for the Chulain player. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you ever see them just not ne- never like, oh, shoot, they have so many cards, they'll never need to use that second ability. They're a well on their way to starting to dominate the table. Right. I would think of Tulane not as a creature deck, but as a storm deck. So you really need to make sure that you're interrupting the amount of cards they have in their hand yeah. uh, and that you're not just dead to a crater hoof, which is often the win con in Tulane. Yeah. And I would say how you deal with Tulane, you just remove it instantly. Yeah. You, you just don't can't even let them have you it. You can't long. let them have it. Yeah. Because even if they're casting it for seven mana, that's still an insane deal for what Tulane does as a commander, mm-hmm. I think. So. Yeah. 
So keep an eye on Chulain. Don't let him get out of control. Uh, the next commander and its archetype in general is famous for snowballing in in magic. It's mm-hmm. elf ball, specifically Yay. Marwin the Nurturer. So this is two in the green for an elf druid. One, one, whenever another elf enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one qu- counter on Marwin the Nurturer. And hey, you know what? Tap Marwan, add an amount of green equal to Marwin's power. Yeah. So you can sort of see what happens here, right? You uh, play some elves. Marwan becomes a 5-5 five, five eventually. You tap it for five, and then you have any number of cards that untap Marwin, and you just do it again and again and again. You dump your whole hand. You're able to activate abilities. You just win the game. Mm. Yeah. It's uh, elf ball spiral is out of, out of control. You really... You can give them maybe a turn with Marwin, mm-hmm. but after once it becomes a five five or a six six, which is very quickly yeah, <laughs> in an elf quickly. deck, uh, we're looking at infinite combo territory with Staff of Domination or any number of untapped stuff. Um, if there's any kind of card draw engine like a Guardian Project yep. or a Beast Whisperer. Um, that's when you're really in for it. Right. That means that when you cast creatures, you make more mana, you draw more cards, and you untap, or when you cast more creatures, you untap. And then, eventually, you draw a big scary threat and something to dump all that mana into. Yeah, elves typically have, like, Wirewood Symbiote and all sorts Mm -hmm. of creatures that allow them to untap creatures. And so that's what you really have to be aware of. And here's the thing, too, with Marwyn decks, is that they're playing an elf on turn one, they're playing Marwyn on turn two, even if you kill Marwyn then, by turn three, they're able to cast it plus more elves mm. and maybe they have a haste enabler, who, whatever it is. So this is the kind of deck where it's not just one removal will slow them down. A mm. two-lane deck, you, you waste a path to exile on at one time. Yeah, that's going to slow them down a, a decent amount. But Marwyn just comes right back out the gate. Um, so that's one of those things where it's got to be not just, you're looking for board wipes, really, right? right? You want to kill a lot of different elves so they don't have the ability to tap all of them, do all their shenanigans, and then use an Azuri Renegade Leader or an Allosaurus Shepherd to pump them up to killable moments, right? Yeah, I with elves, I think you're not going to be able to control the amount of mana they have. Like, you can you can try, and there's targeted removals. You can pick off big, like, Circle of Dreams Druid and these big mm-hmm. elves that tap for a ton of mana. But generally, the redundancy in elves with mana is so high that it's it when you remove one mana dork, another one will, will spawn yeah. in its place. Um, so I think interrupting mana sinks like Allosaurus Shepherd and Azuri Renegade Leader, which turns mana into a win. Yeah. Or interrupting Cardra engines and making sure they don't have places, more cards yeah. to spiral out of control like Guardian Project. Um, or the if there's a new like crown leafed druid. Oh yeah, or crown leafed druid's pretty yeah. good too. Um, just give them, put more cards in their hand and continue the engine. You try and interrupt the ability to snowball. Yeah, and you know cyclonic rift washout. Those types of spells are pretty good, but they also are just again giving you one turn typically because mm-hmm. by the time it comes back to them, they'll tap for five mana, play five creatures, and they're just right back in it. So if you're playing against elves, make sure that you've got a board a board wipe or a way to get access to one. Oh, boy. This may be worse than Chulain, this next card we're about to talk about. I mean, talk about value. This is Omnath, Locus of Creation. Red, green, white, and a blue for a legendary creature elemental. This is a 4-4. It says, when Omnath enters the battlefield, draw a card. It cantrips. And then it says landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life. If this is the first time this ability has resolved this turn, if it's the second time, add red, green, white, blue. If it's the third time, Omnath deals four damage to each opponent and each planeswalker you don't control. Right. Planeswalker attacks very rarely relevant, but the rest of it, insane. So just by playing the card, the cantrip, they get another card into their hand. Mm. Very good already. And then it's got three levels of landfall. The first Mm. time, it just gains them four life, which is a big deal. Mm. The second time, it's going to give them four mana. And the last time, it's going to deal four around the table. So that's 12 damage to each, to, to the whole table, basically. Landfall decks are really hard to play against because there's typically not a ton that you can respond to. Like right. The lands just come down if they if you don't have a way to interrupt immediately, things are going to get out of control. So what Wizards did with Omnath is they cleverly added this when it enters the battlefield draw a card thing. <laughs> so there is one moment <laughs> where when you it can enters actually... the battlefield, you can remove Omnath before they have a moment to play a land. To play a land. Right, because there's an ETB trigger. Right. So you can respond to that draw a card trigger. 
The problem is you think they that's already, why they put it in there. Yes, oh, I, really? they have come out and said oh, that they they okay. were like, I don't think it should draw a card. Maybe it scries <laughs> <laughs> or something. Scry would have been nice. Like, <laughs> jeez. But that's like it was on there to be like, hey, warning. Right, um, Omnath is here. Do something about it now right. if you can. So you can respond to that ETB trigger. You can respond to all of the landfall triggers. Right. But remember, landfall is just so free. <laughs> yeah. And this deck is built to get to three land drops every turn. Right. It has Harrow, it has fetch lands. This is the kind of deck, too, where if you remove a Crucible of Worlds mm. or you Bajuka Bog them when they have a um, Loam. Life from the Loam. Life from the Loam in their mm. graveyard, right? Those are the key things that you have to get rid of because that's Omnith is great by himself. And typically mm-hmm. you'll find that players will play Omnith and they'll have a hand loaded with ways to get to that, you know, at least to the second trigger because right. adding that mana is really nice and then the damage is nice but it's not really i think how omnath decks plan to win the game a lot of times it's it's there to add enough damage and then they'll get in some other ways mm-hmm. um but yeah this is just one of those things where like even when they pass turn if they have enough fetch lands on the table they can just start not getting the mana doing crazy things on your turn yeah so you have to be really careful about omnath get rid of it as soon as possible because I have seen way too many games where people are like, "That's eh, fine, just let it go one turn," and that one turn is all they needed mm-hmm. to have an inst- to create an insurmountable advantage that no one else could c- catch up with. Yeah, I mean, Omnath is completely free, right? This is a card that replaces itself with another card, and mm-hmm. then if you hit two land drops, it replaces the mana that you put into it. Yeah, so it just immediately sets you up for it. Like it's completely free to cast on four if you have a fetch land, mm-hmm. uh, and then then their engine is on board. They have all the mana that they started their turn with yeah. and they can keep going. And the four so. life too is insane. So I think if you see an Omnith deck around your table and they're the clear commander threat, mm-hmm. you should not feel bad attacking them. Yeah. They will likely get back to their starting life total the turn they play Omnith. Right. Right? I would or say find that like, aggro, unless you go way over the top, is not a great strategy for an Omnath deck because yeah. it's gaining so much life incidentally that it's like, you know, two two turns with Omnath, you gain eight life. Ugh. That's a huge, like that's more than two turns of chip damage. Usually. Yeah. 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 So making sure that you have either a plan to remove Omnath or a way to go way over the top with it, maybe focus your commander on Omnath early. So you can get in that early commander damage that might make the difference in the long run. Yeah. These types of decks too, if you can put enough pressure on them, it makes a big difference when they have to make a choice from a lower life total or from a pressured position Mm -hmm. as opposed to like cool i'm at 56 and nothing's threatening me i can do whatever i want right i'm not scared so i think those are the ways to really pressure these decks to be like shoot i'm on the back foot i cannot make that risky play now even though i'm gaining all this life or whatever so yeah beware one more thing to mention with omnath it has a lot of text on it and often the planeswalker thing the four damage to each planeswalker uh, that you could don't control doesn't matter. Mm. But if you have a planeswalker, I have watched so many planeswalkers get smoked by an Omnath. <laughs> and because they know they is on board, yeah. they just don't remember that they have that. Right. So keep an eye, like if there's an Omnath at the table, remember the planeswalker moment because it yeah. is... Uh, don't plan on using your planeswalker to get rid of Omnath or something. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it it's might not just, be there. <laughs> I've watched so many that it's like, okay, free removal spell. And you're like, Oh, no, it's a Planeswalker board wipe. (laughs) Devastating. Um, Okay, so let's talk about one more in the category of one to two turns, and you're going to be done, Mm though. It's Prosper, Tomebound. Uh, Two, a black and a red for a 1-4 Tiefling Warlock with Death Touch, and it has two abilities. The first is, at the beginning of your end step, exile the top card of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. And the second ability is, whenever you play a card from exile, create a treasure token. So that, unfortunately, is the real problematic yeah. text on Prosper. Because the first part, that's cool. It's impulsive draw, great. Mm-hmm. But the second text is not specifically referring to that card that you exile. It's any time you play a card from exile. And now there is just a bountiful number of ways to do so in these colors. I think Prosper is as powerful as some of the green like value commanders that we've talked about before. Mm-hmm. But Prosper sort of flies under the radar because it doesn't scream value the way that the other ones do. It's right. red and black value. But it's every time you cast a spell in a deck like this, you will be making a treasure token. Yeah, because you're going to be loading your deck with these effects. Yeah, it, this like Prosper is effectively 
it, it just says your spells cost one less to cast as yeah. long as they have an engine online. Yep. And it draws a card every turn. Plus it has death touch. So often the deck will be designed to like put a pinger on its prosper so it oh. can remove creatures even. Yeah. I mean, if you remember when Becca played this on game nights, even then I was like, oh my gosh, we are just getting outclassed immediately when Prosper is out. And it was not even close. It felt like a snowball effect. And then she just played a single card that does some exiling. You're mm-hmm. like, oh, we're even further behind them before. Yeah. Do you think it is the best treasure commander in existence right now? Um, it's two colors, which does add to its ability mm-hmm. to create treasures. The other ones that we have listed are Magda, which is very powerful, but a little limited. Uh, Tivit, Seller of Secrets. And then Malcolm, Keen-Eyed Navigator, which is sort of just pirates only right it's pirates only but yeah it it, it it's like a cdh commander because yeah. it's so easy to just tivik cares about voting and stuff and it doesn't just create treasures i mean look mm-hmm. prosper is basically storm kiln artist on a commander right but from exile and storm kiln artist is just an insane card in mm-hmm. the decks that's good in and prosper you can design your whole deck around it and you always have access to it in the command zone so yeah i think so i think you're correct that this is the most powerful treasure commander until watsy prints another one don't <laughs> <laughs> easy please less treasures we all agree <laughs> yeah i i think i think prosper is a like a scary commander that we're all like yeah 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 you got to be worried about prosper but i think prosper tends to sit on the board way too long yeah. and much longer than some of like the two lanes and the uh and the omnaths of the world maybe we're just not as afraid of bla- black red yeah and i mean i think these days we should be because there's enough ways to turn turn these treasures that you're making every turn into damage yeah into like card advantage like uh the um, yeah you got like a mayhem devil to sacrifice to ping people yeah or a professional face breaker decide, turns yeah. it into cards there are so many ways to turn just having an artifact into a win con yeah that i think we need to be more afraid of the explosive power of prosper yeah and again they are making treasures with their commander when they're playing cards from exile don't a lot of times people just don't remove commanders because they feel bad Mm because the players just played it yeah but that is the point of removing a commander when the player just plays it because they you cannot allow it to stick around yeah and you know mess around and find out you will start losing and you're not going to be able to you're going to think oh shoot had i just taken more proactive action maybe i wouldn't be in as bad of a position as i am now but because i let it wait and then i removed it later i'm actually further behind them than sort of keeping at parity because these right. commanders are so good they come out and they get to parity again as right. we just saw with omnath marwin prosper and um our first one chulain yeah i think just introducing any kind of stumbling block in front of a value commander just just removing it once and yeah. making them catch up a little bit just having making sure that you have your own engine to try and match their value that's the way that you you take down a value deck right um is one targeted removal spell a lot of the time will will like recasting prosper for six feels slow yeah definitely. so one removal spell will go a long way to not losing the game to these okay i said one to two turns was fast turns out there are even faster commanders to be aware afraid of we're getting faster yeah this next category of commanders is commanders that have to attack to get their value and you're worried about them attacking but they're not exactly a problem unless they're coming at you. Right. So these are cards that you're like, these are they're going to be scary, but you can sort of hold that swords until they're declared your way. Uh, or threaten to be like, oh, I'm going to kill it if you point that thing at me. <laughs> right, yeah. it's uh, If you have a Maze of Ith, you can normally be, be like pretty fine about these. They're commanders to be concerned about especially if they have protection or if they have haste. Yep. Uh, Lightning Greaves is terrifying against these commanders, but most of the time, if you can interact, you're going to be okay for a second. Yeah, but definitely also beware of Lightning Greaves and oh. Swiftfoot Boots. Yeah. These are come. cards that, yeah, they'll mess you up real bad because then untargetable. Yep. Not so great. All right, let's go to the first one here. It it's- is Kalamax the Storm Sire. <laughs> You used to see a lot of Kalamaxes. I've seen a little bit less, so I was excited to bring him up here because he still is scary in this category. Very much. It's one green, blue, and a red for an elemental dinosaur 4-4. Four, four. It says, whenever you cast your first instant spell each turn, if Kalamax the Storm Sire is tapped, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Whenever you copy an instant spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Kalamax. Yep. 
So Calamax famously goes infinite with any sort of fork spell. Yeah, which is doubling up a spell that you've just cast because it can just point it at itself Mm -hmm. and then just goes over and over and over and over again, right? Yeah. So if you cast fork with Calamax tapped, so if you attack with Calamax, Mm -hmm. you cast fork, the fork targets the 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 fork. No room for spoons. And now Calamax is an infinitely large elemental dinosaur and he is coming your way. Yeah. And there was no, you know, the forks don't do anything, right? Yeah. Just copying themselves, but that doesn't matter because Calamax has the ability to make it infinitely large at that point. Yeah, and I I think just a warning on on Calamax that this is always possible. Just always block Calamax. Mm-hmm. Always, it's the kind of commander that looks like it's going to be a spellslinger com- commander, and it is, but it can also kill you with commander damage just out instantly. of nowhere. Yeah, Car- people can also just fling Calamax too. After yeah. it's like, cool, you blocked it. Cool, I made it a thousand, a thousand. Mm. Fling, deal a thousand to you. You're dead. Yeah. So there's a lot to be afraid of with Calamax just because the infinite is just printed on the card, pretty much. Yeah, and that's not even to mention. just the value on Calamax alone. Like casting a Harrow, sacking two lands, getting four is an incredible use of Calamax early. So make sure that you keep an eye on this commander. He may be a dinosaur, but he isn't a silly boy at all. (laughs) Are dinosaurs silly boys? Yeah, dinosaurs are silly boys. Colossal Dreadmaw is not silly. He is a a silly boy. That is a scary (laughs) 6-6. It's better than all the cards we're talking about today, too, which is kind of (laughs) crazy. That's true. Colossal Dreadmaw. (laughs) OP. The next one doesn't have a attack on it but when it attacks and it's able to do its thing you might be dead because it's scion of the ur dragon 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 the original big uh big dragon menace it's uh, all five colors so five wooberg for a four four flying and it has the activated ability of two mana search your library for a dragon permanent put it into your graveyard and if you do scion becomes a copy of that card until end of turn then shuffle your library so why do we always need to block scion uh because it- if Scion doesn't have Infect now, <laughs> he will soon. Uh, Two mana get Skitherix out. Yeah, the trick with Scion is often they'll turn it into a Molten Steel Dragon and use the Fire Breathing ability to buff it up before above 10 and then activate turn and then activate Scion again and turn it into Skitherix, the Blight Dragon. So it'll be a 10-10 flying Infect. Yeah, and Molten Steel Dragon allows you to do the ability with... Uh, um phyrexian mana so you just pay you know what, what's uh, do it six times so you mm-hmm. just pay 12 life and then you 12 life four mana you're dead with sign attacking you right and you do this on the stack so it's it's all going to be at instant speed and you're like well it's not a skitherix now jimmy no way i'll uh, no blocks <laughs> See you K-O. later, K-O. K-O. Uh, Scion, there's a lot of really powerful dragons just generally, um, but if this combo hasn't happened yet, uh, it will happen soon. If you're playing Scion, yeah. I I have, I don't think I've ever played against a Scion deck that doesn't run the Skitherix trick. Well, at least it has Skitherix in it. Right. right, yeah. I feel like with Scion decks too, the big thing is that dragons need to be attacking to do damage mm-hmm. and that's typically their power so that's why sign is scary when they attack but there's also just all sorts of things sign can do just add instant speed to protect itself come an old knob bone or yeah. become hex proof yeah so there's lots of different things that sign can do and if it becomes old knob bone it doesn't even need to attack other yeah. creatures can attack Bonk. to give you that yeah. yeah so this is just like scary on many many different levels obviously the activation of that and you can do it multiple times you can do it in response to itself people that play against sign for the first time too don't know that they don't mm-hmm. they'll go oh i didn't realize you could stack different scions mm-hmm. triggers on top of each other to make it into this into that it's like yeah that's the point of the deck not to mention it just puts it in the graveyard <laughs> like yeah, it's in exactly. the tomb so it's like reanimate and now i have an old knot bone yeah i had one last yeah. turn and now i do have like, another one yeah i've so, seen end step sign trigger reanimate on the mi- next main and then you're just in trouble tutors in the command zone who knew who knew uh, the next one is an old scary card, but a goodie as a, is Scion, I suppose. It's Kalia of the Vast. This is the original boogeyman for me when I first started playing. It's a Commander. scary, comi- it's a scary, scary, scary card, Still and is. it remains that way. It is one red, white, black. So one and Mardu for a two-two flying human cleric. It says whenever Kalia attacks an opponent, you may put an angel, demon, or dragon creature card from your hand onto the battlefield, tapped and attacking that opponent. Well, there's no scary angels or demons or dragons. Heck nah. There's none. There couldn't be Gisela Blade of Gold Knight. Doubling up all your damage, having it towards yourself. Yikes. Uh, couldn't be a master of cruelty. 
please. First Strike Death Touch comes in, puts you at one, then Kalia finishes the job off, getting yeah. around its text. <laughs> that was the original thing that made me go, magic is so cool. <laughs> when Craig put in Master of Cruelty, and I was like, but you can't do that. It says it can only attack alone. It's like, no, Kalia gets around certain things Enters like attacking. Yeah. Could be a villas broker of blood. Uh, oh yeah, just an eight-eight flyer that allows you to draw a hundred cards. Yikes! <laughs> Couldn't be a bloodthirster. A this new is card. A new demon. When it deals combat damage to a player, untap it at the beginning of this combat phase. There's an additional combat phase. Bloodthirster can't attack a player that has already attacked this turn. So Kalia doesn't untap, but Bloodthirster does, and it mm. can just keep swinging at other things. Yeah. Pretty scary. Uh, it doubles up the. I guess it doesn't have haste when it comes in, so you yeah. can't attack on the next one, but it gives you multiple Kalia triggers the next turn after, unless you have a way to give it haste, which, you know, yeah. it's Kalia. Well, you it's might. Kalia. There's plenty of ways of doing it. You might. Balefire Dragon is one that I always forget about, and I then it comes card. down, and board you're wipe. like, it just wipes your whole board, <laughs> and you're like, cool, thanks, Kalia. I should have removed you. You're right. <laughs> yeah, or Kalia just brings in, uh, you know, Avacyn, and it makes everything indestructible. Yep. That, that's sort of what I've seen a lot of Kalia decks do. By the way, Kalia is in black, so you can mm -hmm. just tutor these cards to your hand, and I've seen people also go like, no, look, my hand's done. I have nothing in it. Kalia attacks. It won't even do anything. Mm -hmm. Their deck is likely 25 to 30 creatures that Kalia wants to put in. They have a 33% chance of just top decking it next turn. Yeah. So even if the player is begging you not to, you just cannot let Kalia attack if you have the ability to stop it. Yeah. Especially or, not at you. Yeah, exactly. If it's not if it's not going at you, it's not so bad. But I've seen players do that and be like, it's fine. There comes an Avacyn. Oh, my deck is literally not prepared to handle this. Right. I can't stop. Too much. Yeah, I can't yeah. stop you. Yeah. Kalia is the, the kind of commander, whereas all of the commanders are in this category, where if there is protection, if there is haste, she is twice as scary. Yeah. So having the removal for Kalia, whether you think she's coming at you or not, is so important just to have the mana open, because if you get hit with a Master of Cruelties, you will regret tapping that planes. Yep. Board wipes too are very good against Kalia if mm -hmm. you, they don't have the indestructible thing out because maybe they've gotten a couple swings in, their board is huge, and here's the thing, they're cheating mana cost too. So a board wipe, if they're stuck with like seven, eight drops in their hand, then a board wipe will really set a Kalia back. Um, I've also seen just taking out the Lightning Greaves be enough. Mm -hmm. Just the play Kalia past turn is enough for a whole table to go, cool, we're ready to stop it next turn should we decide that we need to yeah she's only a 2-2 like an abrade will take kalia out yeah no problem um so just make sure that you are ready for her. luckily kalia is the kind of deck that flags scary early so a lot of the table is like okay we're all in agreement we don't want to die to this right yeah, yeah. compare kalia to kalamax kalamax yeah. if you're a new player you're reading it you have, don't really know what can happen mm -hmm. and kalia you read it, you go oh that seems very good mm -hmm. something scary is coming out of it and uh that's exactly why this next commander is scary as well it's new kalia yeah, it's Satoru sort of. <laughs> Umazawa, one blue black for a 2-4 human ninja. Whenever you activate a ninjutsu ability, you get an impulse. You get to look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order, and it triggers only once each turn. Is it impulse? It's close. It's anticipate. Yeah. Uh, and then it also says each creature card in your hand has ninjutsu for two, a blue, and a black. So what this means is that you can return an un- blocked attacker to your hand and pay the ninjutsu cost of another card in this case every creature in your hand and that enters the battlefield tapped and attacking and is also unblocked so you can cheat in crazy things similar to kalia as long as you have a little creature that's unblocked yeah so i think satoru is scary the way kalia is because it people's your our, your mind is just like the half blight steel like mm -hmm. they it's a, it's going to be a blight steel it's going to be unblocked it's going to be hitting me and i'm, I'm going to be dead uh like you always assume that they have master of cruelties because they might yep um so i think satoru is the kind of commander that you have to keep you just you just know you just assume that they have something yeah, and you you cannot afford to ever be the person that is not blocking their creature and yeah. a lot of times they have invisible stalker or mm -hmm. that changeling outcast or whatever, they just cannot be blocked. Right. And the curve is easy, right? Turn one or two, you play your unblockable creature. Turn three, you play uh, Satoru. And then turn four, you have the mana to ninjutsu out. Mm -hmm. And that's with no ramp at all. You could just die to a Blightsteel at that point. Yeah, I mean, even if they don't have a Blightsteel, there are some very, very scary combat damage triggers that yeah. could happen. If they happen out of nowhere, the game is basically over. Like if they put an ancient silver dragon into play <laughs> and draw 10 cards on a moderate roll, they draw 10 yeah, yeah. cards. <laughs> Pretty bad. It is out of control. 
Yeah, not to mention there are also just a bunch of ninjutsu cards that give Satoru just automatically some card advantage. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't have anything, they have the ability to just dig for more with the ability Satoru gives it and with other cards that already have ninjutsu on them or cards that are going to have a cheaper ninjutsu mm -hmm. cost like Silent Blade Oni is a, a six, seven mana spell that has a six mana ninjutsu cost, but turns into four when mm -hmm. Satoru's out. So that's another way that they're cheating costs and making cards that aren't supposed to be that good even better. Right. And this one that deals combat damage, you get to look at that hand and a player's hand and then cast any spell you want without paying its mana cost. Right. Which could just end the game too. Which could spot. just end the game depending on what's in your hand. Like Sphinx Ambassador has a similar thing, but it's more of a bribery. So you search that player's library for a card and oh, then yeah. that player guesses that card is like, see if you can name it. And then if you didn't name it, you, you get it on the put it on the battlefield. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. There's a good chance they won't name it. Yeah. There's also a good chance they will, if depending on how well they know their deck and you. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> this is a tricky thing about Sphinx Ambassador. But yeah, having that that combat dr damage trigger come out of nowhere is exactly how you lose a game to one of these. these yeah, quick combo we commanders yeah when someone plays an ancient silver dragon you can see it coming from a mile away mm -hmm. so you can say cool that thing's not going to deal damage to me but when it's a changeling outcast or a slither blade that turns into it mm -hmm. out of nowhere then that's when you're really in for trouble and especially because again this could happen as early as turn three you know yeah all right, we've got a lot of scary commanders to go. The next group of commanders are even faster than the ones we've been talking about <gasps> already. The ones that need to be removed on the spot. So stick around, but first we're gonna have a quick word from our sponsors. Hello, my friends. It is I, Angelo the Painter. Assassin, an artist, all in one. Like you, I am passionate about my hobby. There are those who think it macabre, but I like to believe I have a knack for finding beauty in all things. Perhaps that is why I love to shop on Etsy so very much. You see, you don't need a knack to find beautiful things on Etsy. For instance, I bought a new pair of gloves after getting a red paint on my old ones. Now I look sharper than ever. Etsy has everything. Furniture, jewelry, art not made from blood. For you magic players, there are card altars and custom gaming accessories that are a cut above the rest. No matter your budget or the occasion, on Etsy, you can always find something to die for. Ooh, I'm going to buy some new paintbrushes. Ooh, and a dagger. <laughs> uh, purely um, decorative, of course. New to Etsy? Use the code NEW for 10% off your first purchase. That's code NEW, N-E-W. Maximum discount value of $50. Offer ends June 30th, 2023. See terms at etsy.com slash terms. For home style and gifts, shop etsy.com. Etsy has it. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Hey, Rachel, Foundry Inspector. It's a good ramp card, right? Sure. It's cost reduction, so the more spells you cast, the more mana you save. Well, Honey does basically that, but for money. I like money. Tell me more. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for coupons and promo codes so you don't have to. All you do is install Honey and shop online like you normally do. Then when you get to checkout, just click apply coupons and Honey will automatically find any working promos you can apply. And it doesn't just work on desktops, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and save on the go. No matter what you're buying, dog toys, desk lamps, monitors, video games, Honey can help you find deals on just about anything. So it's just strictly better than shopping normally? Yeah, last week I was looking for a new Bluetooth speaker and honey found me a $35 cashback deal. Huh, that's just enough to buy you a Rhystic study. <laughs> I'm way ahead of you. Josh, you have a problem. Yes, I do. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. Get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash command zone. That's joinhoney.com slash command zone. Deep within the jungles of Ixalan, a primal hunger awakens. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Galta, and let me tell you, I am one hungry, hungry dino. Now that it's warm out, I'm always on the go, which means I'm working up a bigger appetite than ever. Thankfully, I have Factor to help me power up for springtime. Factor delivers chef-crafted meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes, perfect for those ancient cravings that just can't wait. That means no more trips to the grocery store and no more picking up expensive takeout. Plus, with over 30 nutritious meals each week, including options from keto to protein plus, they always have tons of delicious choices to devour, like their scrumptious herb-crusted chicken. And since each meal is dietitian approved, they're sure to keep you energized from immortal sunrise to immortal sunset. Factor really is the dino-mite way to fuel your dino-mite. <laughs> 
Head to factormeals.com slash command50 and use code command50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code command50 at factormeals.com slash command50 to get 50% off your first box. All right, welcome back to the scariest commanders to sit across the table from, or I guess to your left or right, depending on where you are. <laughs> depending on the table orientation. Yeah, uh, <laughs> these next commanders are incredibly powerful. In fact, so powerful that you got to remove them immediately because they are the kind that kill you the next time they untap. Yeah, so a lot of these are going to be attack triggers like the ones that we just talked about, but these are the ones that just can't connect under any circumstances. Yeah, it doesn't matter who they hit. Whether they're coming at you or anybody, they're going to go off if they're allowed to untap. Uh, it could also be commanders that are most powerful when they have access to more mana. Mm -hmm. So when they've cast them and they tap and they're like, if I untap, I basically win. Yeah. Um, so this category is you have, you know, three turns, three players turns to yeah. get, make sure that the next player doesn't untap with their terrifying commander. And again, typically because these commanders need to attack or get haste, that means the lightning greaves, swift foot boots world makes them even scarier. And oftentimes if they have that out and then cast your commander and can equip it, the game is over. You have to be ready for these you because they're coming and they're coming fast. Yeah, you can block Calamax and be somewhat safe. Mm -hmm. You can hope Callie doesn't swing at you. But if any of these cards just attack and connect, bye-bye. Yeah, this not first even, one. Not even connect, actually. <laughs> but this first one does need to connect. This first one does need to con con connect. Like, luckily, it's a 5-4 trample. For blue, a black, a red, and a green, it's Yidris, Maelstrom Wander, Wielder. Excuse me, Maelstrom Wielder. <laughs> it kind of, yeah, I, I similar, merged similar. it with the other Cascade Commander. But it says, <laughs> whenever Yidris deals combat damage to a player as you cast spells from your hand this turn they gain cascade oof so cascade just so you know when you cast a spell exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less you may cast it without paying a span of cost and then you ex put the other cards on the bottom of your library in a random order so anytime you cast a spell it now gains cascade which means you get a two for one you get two spells yeah and one turn with every time one card becomes two cards is so much value, especially when that second card is free every time. Or has Cascade on it. Or has Cascade, which is usually the case with Yidris or, yeah. or commanders that have Cascade on them. They're going to be built to Cascade and Cascade and Cascade and Cascade. So a yep. two for one becomes a three for one, becomes a four for one, becomes a five for one. And then their board is so crazy on turn, what is this, four ish yeah yeah four, like if five. they ramp on two turn three yidris turn four attack yep uh you, you're so far behind and you're like i need a board wipe but they all they have all these enchantments i have 90 cards in hand i don't know what to do mm, yeah and the answer is don't let yidris attack attack at or all. counter spell it that's another way to deal mm -hmm. with these commanders too um and the thing is uh, with the cascade chains if the person is really into building the cascade chain cor like in a specific way they'll go from three and they'll specifically only have these two spells or whatever they can cast by the two and then they'll have a bunch of those spells that come off suspend right that they can cast for free at zero so they should potentially maybe most likely will build in a way to just get a you have a lot of consistency in their game plan mm -hmm. too. So it's not like the cascade thing is like, oh, who knows what's going to happen? It's like, no, we know what's going to happen. And we know it's going to happen in this order. And if you cast a three drop right now, then it's going to happen in that order. If they cast a five drop, that, you know, so that's the kind of thing to be very, very aware of too. Yeah. If Yidris is in the command zone, you, you're likely in trouble anyway. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of these spells in the deck are already going to have Cascade, but you have to know that there is that consistency built in. And if they connect with Yidris, you're, you're going to be way too far behind yeah. to catch up. Yeah, I've seen decks that Yidris is literally just built to get a Tainted Strike out. Yeah. That's their only one drop. You know, they don't even have a Soul Ring in there. Sure. Uh, so they just, they and if they have other ways to shuffle it in too, so they're like, cool, I have a bunch of pump spells mm -hmm. and a Tainted Strike. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, no matter what, when Idris hits, you're going to get infected out. So that's just one of the things to get to be aware of. And the fact that he has Trample yeah. really is what sets it in. It's very, very tricky to block. Uh, so be ready with a removal spell or a big blocker, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if you've oh. got, you know, a zero six is running around or something a zero sixes yeah yeah just a wall deck just a wall deck i should say that the infect person has co extra combat spells is how they do it they'll yeah, yeah. hit you with the address use an extra combat spell that goes to attain a strike mm -hmm. they hit you again yeah bye, -bye. uh Yidris has a plan. It's not just going to be crazy, crazy fun. Uh, if it is crazy fun, be a little worried still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The value is it's just hard. It's just to, so much value. Insane. 
Uh, speaking okay. of extra combats. <laughs> and just win the game when they attack once. It's an oldie but a goodie original boogeyman of the format it's narset enlightened master so she's still scary still scary three and just guys so six mana that's a lot for a three two first strike with hex proof mm. i think people forget narset has hex proof mm. sometimes the hex proof is like why yeah it is a six mana card but it wins the game because mm. whenever narset attacks exile the top four cards of your library until the end of turn you may cast non-creature cards exile with narset this turn without paying their mana costs yeah, you exile the top four. You may cast non any of them. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, like Yidris, Narset decks are designed to win if she attacks. Yep. Most of the deck is going to be ramped on Narset. Uh, get Greaves, get Haste on Narset, anything. Stack the top of the deck with Brainstorm-esque effects. Mm-hmm. Swing. And swing and hit extra turn or extra combat spells yeah both of which are extra turn spells are basically extra combats right because yeah. expropriate or time stretch gives you the ability to swing again the next turn and if they couldn't get rid of narset the first time around they're probably not going to do so the second time around and not to mention if you have six mana then you can just cast your time warp or whatever right, right. you also can just start casting spells from your hand that do the thing that narset's trying to do yeah, Narset is one that you have to be ready for. And because it has Hexproof, it isn't particularly easy to take care of. Yeah. You need a board wipe. You need an edict spell to make them sacrifice it. Or something like a Shadow Spear to get rid of the Hexproof. Yeah, Glaring Spotlight, I think, is another way to do sure. so. Yeah, it, and you're not really running Glaring Spotlight in many decks. Yeah. Shadow Spear is a little more common. Narset is just a bully. It's really hard to interact with. Um, it's one of those decks where I think when someone pulls it out, it's like, hey, I want to win this game. Mm -hmm. Is usually what I see from that player when they're trying to play Narset. So I've played against Narset variants where they're like, it's not extra turns Narset. It's this what it, Narset. What is it? Or it's this <laughs> Narset. Okay. I played against like Super Friends Narset. And oh, I played gosh. against like any of like various Narsets where mm -hmm. they're like, I, I like um, uh, Voltron Narset where it's like, I'm trying to hit equipments that a lot of equip or that kind of thing. Sure. I think I'm still worried about Narset above everything else mm -hmm. because when you attack, you cast fo up to four spells for free. Yeah. And your deck has all the colors and things to load the top of your deck with exactly what you want. Yeah. And uh, like, this is the kind of commander that I think a lot of people are really drawn to and are, are like, I, I really want to play Narset, but I don't want everyone to hate me. What do I do? <laughs> what do I do? And it's so tricky when your commander is so powerful and also is impossible to interact with on a spot, in a spot removal, removal basis. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would encourage you if you're like really drawn to Narset and you really want to play her, shifting into another commander um because it, there's really not a good way to put a commander as scary as narset mm -hmm. in the command zone and expect people not to do everything in their power to remove her yeah i've seen narset take the place of the 99 in sure. spell slinger decks because mm -hmm. they're like i don't want to win the game with these narsets but it would be cool if i cast like this and this for free because i'm a deck that wants to you know i'm yeah. a, a kai car deck or whatever so I, there are spots for narset in the 99 and then when that hits I love it's that idea. still very scary don't yeah. get me wrong but it's not, oh, shoot. Well, there goes my game, because mm -hmm. if it swings once, I'm just done for. All right. Uh, this next one is similarly powerful if she attacks. Uh-oh, it's Najila, the Blade Blossom. Why did they make this card? This card <laughs> <laughs> is an egregious design mistake. Five uh, <laughs> colors. No, if it was mono red, I'd be like, sure, whatever. Yeah. But, okay, read it. Two in red. Uh, for a 3-2 human warrior, it says whenever a warrior, including Nujila, attacks, <laughs> you may have its controller create a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature token that's tapped and attacking. So it, it continues. I could attack and get a warrior, right? Uh-huh. Whenever nice. any warrior. Cool, cool. It's not it's broken a anymore. May ability. Oh, uh, <laughs> so I can't even, you can't even like accidentally get yeah. your opponent's warriors. Whoops. It also has an activated ability that makes her color identity five colors. Uh -huh. It's white, blue, black, red, green, Wooberg, untap all attacking creatures. They gain trample, lifelink, and haste until end of turn. Haste? After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. Activate this ability only during combat. Uh, there is the nerf. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we found it. Nujila is an incredible... So when I first started playing Commander, I built Nujila, uh -huh. and it was Warriors. I was like, Nujila, like Warrior oh, cool. theme, yeah, and I want to play Warriors, yeah, and she's yeah. pretty. And, and I was like, that'll be fun, and it's 
terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, even just as an aggro, like, incidental token deck, this is an impossibly powerful commander. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one activation should be game over in a lot of yeah. cases, right? Because what you do, like, if they attack with Najila once, they make one warrior. If they get an extra combat, now there's four warriors. Mm-hmm. If they get an extra combat, now there's eight, eight warriors. If they have another warrior that happens to be around, that happens even faster. So this is, like, Najila goes in decks where she is a single card combo yeah. essentially yeah uh but she does go infinite turns with various combo pieces that you should keep an eye on it's derevi imperial tactician also a scary commander yeah uh druid's repository Oof, gets you all that mana nature's will yeah uh, bear umbra and uh, sort of feast and famine old Nawbone. the list continues uh yeah. anything that makes mana when you attack or connect basically goes infinite with Nujila. Yep. And it's five colors, so it's in the deck, or it could be. Yeah, this is just one of those cards, too, where you cannot face a version of this that doesn't... They, they can't do the thing, like, with... Where we were just talking about Narset, where they're like, no, it's a, this kind of deck. It's like, uh, even if it is. It's, I cannot risk it not being that, because then the game is just over. I'd have to play against that Najila deck like three, four times before right. I can then go, uh, it's fine. Just, yeah, they're trying to put out, I don't know. Yeah. It's some random thing. There's a changeling deck or something. Right. It's, um, and Najila is the kind of, kind of thing where it's like, you just can't, unless there is a level of trust and you're in your play group and they have seen the deck. Yeah. If you were in an untrusted play situation, if you're at a game store or you're at a magic event, looking at these, as these commanders, there's just no, nothing you can say that makes them less scary. And I promise like, if you, if you're like, I have this stipulation on it where it's like I, the only, all the only cards in this deck are warriors you still have to treat this like Najila yeah. because it is that powerful. Well, yeah, so, even if they just naturally play, pay the Uberg and they have six warriors on the battlefield, that's 12 warriors on the next attack. So fast. Yeah, so you're just going to die to regular combat damage, not even any infinite shenanigans. Right. So be ready for Najila, have a board wipe, or just don't let it Spot attack. Spot removal. Uh, this next one has that scary, like, what could it be mm. uh, thing to it. Probably bad, though. Probably something it's, bad. It's probably... <laughs> It's probably so it's a two bad. it's a two sided card. It is Asika, God of the Tree on the front. You'll never see that side. Yeah, that's... the prismatic bridge on the back. Uh, so we're not even gonna read the front side. It's Wooberg for a legendary enchantment, and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card. Put the card on the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's just an it's just basically it's not an emblem it's an enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep something terrible happens <laughs> well good for you bad for everyone else right <laughs> the prismatic bridge is is the kind of card that i'm like you will never trigger that yeah it, i will mulligan for removal i will you will never trigger it yeah because me. it just needs to be one vorenclex and then it's like oh well that go there goes my game yeah, it's just one two, chin Cataxius. Yeah, there it, goes my game. It's just something free and enormous. The Prismatic Bridge tends to be built so the only creatures or planeswalkers that come out of the deck are horrifying. The worst things in the they're world. They're eight yeah. mana. They're seven mana. They're Ugans and Vorinclex and yeah. Elish Norns, and it's just if it if it triggers twice, the game's over. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now this is one that they do have to untap in order mm-hmm. for it to come uh, and have it do its thing. Whereas the prior uh, cards we just talked about, they're attacking so you can get the Greaves and stuff. Mm-hmm. This is at least a little bit more, hey, right. we have a turn cycle. Can someone stop this? It's very, very projected. So make sure that if there's a Prismatic Bridge across from you or in the Sika, uh, it's it will likely be the bridge. <laughs> yeah, it will be the bridge. If they play a Sika, something's gone very, very wrong. Or they're playing some weird build that you're going to have to figure out what's going on with later. But really, it's yeah. the bridge is... is the, terrifying one a lot of five color commanders in this category the next one is joda archmage eternal yeah, it's so good old joda white blue red uh and one, one and one <laughs> i read it backwards excuse me people so do Jess that guy just guy and one for a flying four three why does he fly uh you may <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point first of all he's just a beater he's uh, more of a floater than a flyer like a four, yeah three flying is huge uh, and then it says you may pay Wooberg rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. Yikes. So anything, any card 
costs five mana as long as you have all the colors. Yeah, and typically your brain needs to go to what is the worst thing that can happen, and that is Omniscience. So that's a 10 mana card that now mm. costs five and says you may cast spells from your hand without paying their mana costs. Typically yeah. this is, oh, Joda's out, Wooberg, Omniscience. Can't do anything about it? I win the game. Or yeah. I'm going to create such a crazy board state and kill everything else that there's nothing you can do to stop me. Yeah, Joda's the kind of commander that if they have eight mana, it's terrifying. If they have four mana and they cast Joda and pass, you need to remove Joda before they come back around mm -hmm. because something is coming out. Especially if they've tutored, like, you're in oh, danger. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a five-color deck, right? It, it could be anything, and you sort of have to treat it like it's going to be the worst thing. It's going to be on Omniscience. It's going to be a one with the multiverse, which is basically new Omniscience yeah. Yeah, off yeah. the top of your library. Um it's just the kind of it's the kind of card that you cannot let do its thing because its thing is horrible and terrifying. Yeah, yeah even I've been in so many cases where it's like, well, I just let them have one turn with it, and it's no. like that was such a bad idea. They're, yeah, it's not even like we can catch up at this point. They're so far ahead. The only time Joe the decks are not scary to me is when they just are not correctly color fixed. Right. So they only have Jeskai to play Joda. They've got some weird signet combination and they don't actually have the Wooberg cost. And mm -hmm. I know they're not going to have on their next turn because there's no way they're going to get two different colors. Right. Right. So I'm like, okay, cool. We're fine because For they don't second. have Wooberg. But that does not mean you can let it go. You still have to know the moment they have it, you have to get rid of it before they can tap. And most of the the thing with Joda is like you don't really cast it until you can until you can cast something crazy with mm -hmm, it. Like mm -hmm. you just wouldn't risk it. Like if you if you play, oh, I guess you need it's four mana, so you would need nine yeah. mana. I said eight earlier, um, but you wouldn't cast Joda unless you can get this huge amount of value, unless you can cast Omniscience yeah. or some kind of ultimatum or Rise of the Dark Realms. Or and just probably hold some... a protection for him too. Right. Yeah. I like, usually Joda decks will have to run a lot of, especially free counter spells mm -hmm. um, to protect him the turn that it comes Your down. Your guardianship it yeah. exists. Joda players might have it in their hand. All right. This next one's scary, scary fast. Yeah, and could just win the game when it comes down to it's the Locust God, four mm -hmm. blue and a red for a god, a four four. It's a flyer. This makes sense. It's got wings. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you draw a card, create a one one blue and red insect creature token with flying and haste. That's the kicker. Why? <laughs> Two blue and a red, you can draw a card, then discard a the card. You're probably not doing that. Uh, and then when the Locust God dies, you return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. Yeah. So this is just blue red. I'm gonna draw thirty cards, and now you're gonna die to a bunch of one one hasties. Yeah, it's Locust God is sort of king of the wheel deck. The deck is designed to draw seven cards, draw thirty cards, draw fifteen cards mm -hmm. fast, and make all of these hasty flyers. Um, I w I would say that I'm scared of the Locust God. I'm also scared of Zyrus the Writhing Storm. Uh, Teamer, which is uh sort of it, so it's two a green blue red for flyer. Whenever an opponent draws a card, except the first one they draw in each of their draw steps, create a one one green snake creature token whenever it deals combat damage to a player you and that player each draw that many cards mm. so i played against a lot of zyrus decks that are like they're like it's a group hug deck I'm like it's not yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> it's locust god uh yeah it's, it's locust, locust god, god with green now it's locust god with ramp yeah yeah um so these kind of decks are very difficult to interact with and you basically have the turn they come down to deal with them before a wheel happens. Yeah, and it's not just a wheel. There are spells that like allow you to put your whole hand on the bottom of your library when mm. you cast a spell and you draw that many cards. And it's not just the 1-1 flyers that are going to kill you either. They're going to be playing Impact Tremors or Perforos God of the Forge so that each of those flyers now deals one or two damage to each opponent. Mm -hmm. And so they'll not even right it could be like oh sure i'm fine i got a bunch of flying blockers they can't attack me it's like no you're gonna die to the perforos and right. then they're gonna swing at someone else yeah and in the turn will be like all right cast cast locust god and then next turn perforos windfall yeah or perforos now, is already there or yeah and, and you just you can't go, deal with it you hold up nine mana locust god windfall or you have teferi's puzzle box already out you know there's right. lots of different ways for that deck to just draw the cards to make all the things and then they can kill you from a multitude of angles which is what makes it so scary yeah locust god also goes infinite with sage of the false so uh keep Hooray. an eye out for that yeah lots of infinites there too mm-hmm Okay, this next one, uh, I don't want to talk about it for too long because I hate it, yeah. and I've found that actually people just don't play it because it's so hated. Yep. It's Turgrid, God of the Fright, God of Fright, three black black for a four or five menace. Whenever an opponent sacks a non-token permanent or discards a permanent card, you can put that card from a graveyard on the battlefield under your control. 
If you sack it, it's mine. If you discard it, it's mine. If you look at it wrong, it's mine. Yeah, typically it that betrays does a similar thing, but that's a you know eleven drop. <laughs> Turgut does that five in mono black with all of the discard effects in Magic's history available to it. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about why Turgrid is scary. I will say this deck is a little bit clunkier than the other decks. It's, yeah. I think it's less powerful than something like the Locust God or even Zyrus, but it is... It will make for a worse time mm -hmm. uh, because it will usually follow up a Turgrid with something like Pox, uh, which makes you sacrifice one third of your lands, discard one third of your hand and lose one third of your life. Yeah, you get all those lands and all those discards. And they just, just for free. go to the Turgrid player. Uh, it'll usually run a lot of Plague Crafter effects, which makes yeah. you sacrifice your creatures. If you are a permanent based deck, you're going to have a tough time against Turgrid. Maybe Turgrid's really good against all of our Narset decks. There you go. Because <laughs> they'll just it's make the answer to Locust God. <laughs> yeah. Gross. Not even, right? Turgrid will find a way to... You know, Locust God will find a way to instant speed draw some cards. <laughs> oh, the other thing that is with Turgrid, it feels like it needs to be said because I've played it against enough Turgrid decks where people do not do this. Yeah. Play your fetches early. <laughs> oh, right. If you're going to be sacrificing anything, do it before Turgrid comes down. It will, like, sometimes they'll power her out with a, with like a Cabal Ritual or yeah. a Dark Ritual or something. But usually, you've got a couple of turns to do your, like, Burnish Hearts and your Fetch Lands. Just do get it, it, before get it done before here, she yeah. comes down. Or just tell your opponent that you're not going to play against a Turgrid deck. Yeah, I think, I think this is the kind of a good a good time to have this conversation where it's like if one of these these commanders comes down and you're like I am not prepared to play against yeah. the level either either you know I don't want to play against Turgrid or is gone. I'm done yeah yeah or it's like I I don't have a deck that will match up against a Locust God deck um it's okay to be like I don't think that that's an appropriate deck for me and to walk and try and find another game yeah and it could be like hey I. All my decks fold to that one. Do you have another one to play? Mm -hmm. If not, I, hey, I'm just going to go find another play group. Sorry. I don't think I can hang in this pod, right? right? It's not necessarily their fault, not your fault either, but it's just not a good match. And you want people to have a good time at the end of a game. And right. these are the, currently this pot, the stew that you're creating. Someone put in all, way too much cardamom, and that cardamom <laughs> is Turgrid. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like... I've played against a lot of Turgrid decks. I've done the testing, and it's not my favorite to play yeah. against. Um but and now I feel comfortable enough because I've done like played against them enough where I'm like, you know what? That's not the kind of evening I'm trying to have. Right. I'm going to I'm going to see if I can find another pod. And it's not about the player. And a lot of people will will be like, well, you know, Turgid players are horrible people. <laughs> like, they're, <laughs> no, they're not. They're magic. No, players. They're, they're magic players. Yeah. They, they and five colors. And everyone's are, allowed to express themselves differently. These are cards that were printed. They're allowed to play with them. But you are also allowed to protect your time mm -hmm. and be like, I don't want to spend the next two hours playing this game Yeah, because I anticipate the kind of game this is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. So protect your time, find a game that you do want to play. Okay, let's move on to the next commander uh, group of commanders here. Uh, and this one is pretty, it's, it's similar to the other ones, but mm -hmm. you got to remove it and we're calling it preferably now. Yeah, some of these some of these cards, it's like they can't untap or they can't attack if they have lightning greaves. Ah, scary. Yeah. But these this next wave of commanders are going to be a problem as soon as they hit the table. Yep. Uh, this first one is probably one people have been like, when are you going to mention this one? It's Corvold, Fae Cursed King, king of taking 20 minute turns. <laughs> king of drawing 20 cards. Two and Jun for a 4-4. Four, four. Flying, whenever Corvold attacks or enters the battlefield, you sack another permanence. And then whenever you sack a permanent, put a plus one, plus one counter on Corvold and draw a card. So, I take it back. Corvold's the best treasure commander. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, actually, because of the sack thing. Doesn't part. say treasures on him. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy, though, right? Corvold comes in, you get rid of a land or a token, whatever, and then you play a Dockside Extortionist, and you, know, you have 15 plus one, plus one counters. That's 15 cards as well, mm -hmm. and 15 mana, and Corvold is going to become a massive creature. You can probably just kill someone at that point. It's going to be huge. It's going to draw a ton of cards and it's going to be a problem as soon as it comes down if they have treasures on board or clues sack or outlets. free sack outlets. Yeah. Anything that they can immediately use as soon as Corvald hits the battlefield. And Corvald does the first sack for you for free. Right, yeah. Uh, so it does give you something to respond to when it comes in. They have to sacrifice something, but if they have treasures on the board or if they have a free sack outlet, they're going to get those draws if Corvold comes down. Yeah, and that's why Corvold is really scary and why you have to get rid of it quickly is because they you're not really setting them that far behind if they've had their board set up. 
Because right. they'll play Corvold, you're like, shoot, kill it immediately. And they're like, cool, I'm going to sack all this stuff, including Corvold, to this Viscerous here, no. draw all these cards, and then maybe I drew the answer sure. to you yeah. trying to kill it, right? I drew a Heroic Intervention or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it is hard to put the Corvold player behind and don't feel bad for getting rid of the Corvold player early as well because that's just mm-hmm. what's going to happen. If they have a sack outlet on board, try and get the sack outlet out of the way before Corvold comes down. They're going to have a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a big mistake I think a lot of people make where they go, the commander is the problem. No, no, and no, 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 no. the no. whole board state get set up. Yeah. And then they play the commander and go, oh, no, the rest of the board is the problem. Right. These are enablers. If there's treasures on board, those are scary. Yeah. If there's a sack outlet on board, those are scary. Corvold is always scary, but th- these are the things that make Corvold scary. Because mm-hmm. on his own, he comes down, he sacks a thing, draws a card, and he's a 5-5 five five with flying. Wow. That's it. If there's a board, unless there's, you know, fetch lands or treasures or something else, which happened to be very popular in Commander, but um, try and anticipate Corvold coming down. Yeah, you can see the pieces forming beforehand, usually. And Jund is known, these colors, right, are known for grindy, mid to late game, get a lot of value engines going type of gameplay. So you should be able to predict it. How many cards do you want to draw if you're a Corvold player and you cast Corvold? And you, like, how many cards do you want to draw if he's immediately removed? Oh, at least three. At least three, yeah. Yeah, I'll have three, like a fetch feel, land, a yeah. sack outlet, and Corvold's drawing you one already. Right, yeah. But See, that's nothing. That's like it's how powerful Corvold is. That you're like, I have yeah. a fetch land up, I have a couple treasures, and he sacks something when he comes down. I'll draw four cards. Yeah, why not? I don't, I don't mind spending five mana to draw four cards. And now it's an eight mana card. And eating eight, eight. an opponent's removal Yeah, spell. exactly. Oh my gosh. Now, when you phrase it like that, it's nuts. Imagine that was just the card. Yeah. Play this five thing choose target opponent to use their best removal spell at yeah. instant speed on you and draw five cards <laughs> that's how good Corvold is you just can't give them time it's kind of like the new Atraxa yeah who's it's, also a preferably also, not even the preferably now it's too late if Counter it's down it. you're yeah, in trouble too late. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. cannot let them get to that mana alright this next one is a new card and I think uh, one of the more scary cards they printed yeah it's Joda the Unifier another Wooburg commander uh, for a human wizard 5-5 five, five, a 6-6 six, six, sort of uh, that's it right. says legendary creatures you control get plus X plus X where X is the number of legendary creatures you control uh-huh. so Joda counts himself and it says whenever you cast a legendary spell from your hand exile cards on the top of your library until you exile a legendary non-land card with lesser mana value sort of cascade for legendary spells Mm -hmm. you may cast that card without paying its mana cost put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order oh but this one doesn't have flying yeah you're right he's (laughs) on the ground now he's just a five mana he's unifying yeah he's decided to unify in his ground campaign this is everything that you should be afraid of in a commander it's uh it's it's card advantage because mm-hmm. it's cascade. It's card. It's mana cheating because it's cascade, yeah. and then it's a payoff because it's an overrun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's nuts. This card's crazy, and <laughs> people I, don't realize too. It's like, oh, I have three creatures out. They're massive. Joda's now an eight eight, and the other creatures are like six sixes they or whatever. Immediately are huge. Yeah. I, so I played against Joda for the first time and they were like, it's a budget Joda. It's a new deck. I'm, I'm sort of a new player. And he's like, I built this deck for her. Yeah. And she plays Joda and her, her partner, whoever was there with her, uh, immediately removed Joda. And I was like, whoa, that whoa. was aggressive. That's aggressive. She's a new, new player. player. Yeah, like, yeah. whoa. And then next turn, she recast Joda and stormed off. <laughs> <laughs> And we we're like, okay, so, ah, uh, not cool. aggressive, noted. Noted, yeah. Even on a budget deck with Joda as the main character, there's so many legendary permanents and spells now that you can cast that it doesn't actually make the deck that much weaker. It isn't a restriction anymore. Like, you should treat Joda like a five-color good stuff cascade commander right. with a payoff on it because it's going to be scary the moment it hits the board. It's yeah. like... Yeah, and you can also huge. load up on legendary creatures before you play Joda. And right. then when you play Joda, now you're swinging with an 8-8 and a 10-10. And it's like, wow, that's game-ending stuff right there. Even if you, like, cast Joda and then follow it up with the Yoshimaru, you cascade into a Rogue Rock, everything gets plus three plus three. Oh, my gosh. Like, and that's from an empty board. Oh, my gosh. So <laughs> suddenly Joda's a 9-9 Yoshi's like... Like these are, I forgot these, about Rogue Rock. You, like, will always, yeah, you Rogue always Rock have a zero. Line. Yeah, wow. It's, uh, Joda is very explosive and very scary, and you mm-hmm. really can't let it trigger the Cascade, but even the overrun bit, the pump part of it is terrifying. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Love that. Well, let's move <laughs> on to the next one. Uh, this one is a classic, just can be CEDH, can just kill you out of nowhere. It's Kirik, son of Yogmoth, or post son of whatever, because Post Malone has his own version yeah. of this card now, because <laughs> uh, he loves it because it's so powerful. It's she very give you powerful. a note. Yeah. It's four and then three for Exian mana, so it's seven total or four and six life, or, you know, whatever the variations are. <laughs> it's a legendary horror minion, two, two, and it says lifelink. So that's nice. You can get some lifelink. But for each black mana in a cost, you may pay two life rather than pay that mana. And then when you recast a black spell, you put a plus and plus one counter on Kirik. So it's a bigger lifelinker. Yeah. To so, make up for all the life you're losing. Yeah. Hooray. <laughs> so your Bolas Citadel now just costs three and three Phyrexian mana. This is also just mono black. Mm-hmm. And mono black is just known to have some of the most broken, you know, mono black infinite combos all over the place. There's that yeah. new card, I forget the name, but there's a new one from Warhammer that's also mono black that just basically says, it says, I think it's Travis or something, the yeah. infinite on it. Right, yeah. So there is a theme going on here with mono black decks, and Kirik is no, uh, you know, no stranger to just winning on the spot. Yeah, K- Kirik is, is usually a storm commander, and it's going to use spells like Necropotence or Bolas' Citadel to get card advantage and just to absolutely storm off. They'll keep CMCs very low and mm-hmm. make sure that you can just, there's too many permanents too fast. Um, something like playing against Kirik is you have to be ready for it to come down. You have to be ready to answer one of these card draw engines because uh, Kirik isn't anything without right. cards. Yeah, you really. have to. Yeah, there's multiple parts because Kirik is almost like an enchantment is right. how I kind of look at it because it allows your other cards to just become really powerful as a result. But also Kirik chip damage matters mm-hmm. if you can get a creature down early and take out eight life yeah your or, six deck life, or whatever yeah, yeah just start hitting the kirik player that takes away their resource that that chips away at the amount of mana they have um so if if there's kirik at tape at the table their aggro like that kind of you should be purposefully trying to chip away at their life total yeah hit them with a lightning bolt that sounds crazy a lot of the time but when they're storming off like this every single life point matters yep yep the scary thing, though, about Kirik is that with a Mana Vault or something, turn one, you can cast them by turn two. Yeah. So it is also scary because those decks are looking to get Kirik out fast and then to use him to gain that life back with the with the attacking and lifelink. Yep. He's coming down fast. You better be ready for him. Better be ready. All right. Next up, we got Varen, Voice of Duality, which uh, just just reads infinite on the card, I guess. One blue and a red, a free wizard, 2-2. Two, two. Has Magecraft, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, you give it plus one, plus one till end of turn. And the second line of text, if you casting or copying an instant or sorcery spell causes a triggered ability of a permanent, t- you control the trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So it's going to double up its own trigger. Yep. obviously, but it's also going to double up all the other triggers that, hey, when you cast an instant or copy an instant or sorcery, do this thing. And a lot of the time in Commander, th- those triggers are the scariest things about Spellslinger decks. Mm-hmm. It's the gutter snipes of the deck. It's the storm kiln artists. Oh, it's yeah. Archmage Emer- Emeritus. Like these these are the, the, <laughs> the things that drive the engine of a Spellslinger deck. Yeah. So it can be so explosive and it's so cheap. It's three mana. Yeah. Varen comes out fast. It feels like another enchantment as well. And you also have cards like Clark the Thumbless now that allow you to potentially just keep casting and copying spells. Yeah. Crazy. And bounce them to your... You actually want the cards to be bounced to your hand with Clark so you can do it again. Right. Famously, on the game nights, Josh played this and he had a graveyard and he had a Mizzix's Mastery and it was like, take a lunch break, everyone. I need three hours to figure out how this turn's going to go. <laughs> It's good because of all of the triggers, the way that you stack this kind of stuff is so important and it all has to go on the stack at the same time. Baron decks are very complicated and are going to take a, a ton of the chess clock. Yeah. Uh, so. But it will also just win usually when it does that big right. thing. So yeah. that's why the get rid of it ASAP is mm. is is in the books here. And don't forget that it has this super prowess thing attached to it. Right. It gets plus, plus two, plus two, plus two. for every <laughs> cast or copy of an instant or sorcery spell. So you can be like, it's a Spellslinger deck. I don't need blockers. You do. You nope. definitely do. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. It's just going to storm off and then hit someone for commander damage. Mm, I've seen that happen somebody too. somebody else. Copy, copy. Yeah. Die. So, Bye. Uh, die, die. Careful. Careful of the Veyrons across the board. Okay, this next one, I agree. You got to kill it ASAP because yeah. this is another one of those 20 minute turn cards. It's a Gitrog monster, the one, Rib the only. 
Three, black and a green furry frog horror. He's a 6'6 six, six with death touch. Sure. At the beginning of your upkeep. <laughs> it's like Joe that was flying. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder how many people in the office, if we asked to read, to like recite Get Rog, would remember he yeah, has death, death touch. touch. on top of everything else. Yeah. <laughs> At the beginning of your upkeep, sacrifice the Get Rog monster unless you sacrifice a land. Downside. You may play an additional land on each of your turns. Upside. Upside? <laughs> uh, whenever one or more lands are put into the graveyard from anywhere draw a card if double you, upside if you mill a land draw a card if you sack a land draw a card draw if a you card. discard a land draw yeah. a card uh the get Rog is a combo engine all on his own yeah it feels like dredge decks in modern or whatever it just has the ability to get you so much card advantage incidentally from doing things that there are again hundreds of cards that do this extraordinarily well Right, and Getrog isn't like the lands commanders that we've talked about before, where he doesn't have an ETB ability right. that you can immediately respond to. So you can Getrog land land, cool. and that and there's no moment between when he resolves and when those lands come down to kill it for you to interact. Um, and Getrog will interact fast if it's coming down. They uh, intend to draw many many cards. Yeah. Um, the ways to interact with Get Rug uh, is Graveyard Hate is a good place Very to good start. Very good start, yeah. If you can get rid of fetch lands, if you can get rid of ways that they can access their graveyard, mm-hmm. Ramian Ac- Excavators, Crucible of Worlds, uh, the new one, uh, Conduit of Worlds. Conduit of Worlds, yep. Um, make sure that you they do not have access to their graveyard. Uh, but they're going to be getting access because the deck will be full of dredge cards <laughs> yeah dredge cards which allow you to mill into your graveyard they'll have discard outlets that allow them to just put stuff into the bin instantly and trigger that uh drawing card ability they're just loops that these decks get into where they'll play life from the loam and they'll do something they'll draw a card and be like you know i'm going to dredge that instead get life from the loam back play that get these lands back play those use those to do this and then they've drawn it's not just that they're just Right, it's not like a limited resource because every time they're getting something into the graveyard, they're drawing off it and they're just keeping it going. Their hand is healthy. And should it come to their upkeep again, they have to sacrifice the land. Well, guess what? They're just drawing more cards. They don't mm-hmm. care because they can play two lands a turn. So it, it just kind of spirals out of control quickly. I think the big thing to interact with when you see a Gitrog uh, deck is making sure they don't have a free discard outlet. Yeah. Because that's how a lot of this stuff happens at instant speed and makes it really discard difficult to yeah. interact with. If they have a dredge card, they can discard it to the sack outlet. They can discard a land and then dredge instead of drawing and then yeah. discard the dredge card again. This all happens at instant speed. They can do it in response to your removal spells. So prepare for get rog. Make sure they don't have a noose constrictor. I know that card looks bad. It is very, very good in this deck Get yeah Rock. oblivion crown they can cast at flash speed and it has the basically the same ability as putrid imp mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh, sylvan crazy. safekeeper needs to go as oh, soon as possible obviously you yeah. can sack lands and get something shroud until end of turn yep okay all right, that does it for the uh, preferably now category of when to get rid of these scary, scary commanders. We have one more remaining here, uh, and this is not necessarily removing the commander. Yeah, these are these are commanders that you're not going to be able to meaningfully interact with the commander itself. Right. They're going to be able to do the thing basically like no matter how many times you remove it yeah. essentially uh and the first one will make this clear it's yuriko the tiger's shadow yeah bears a lot of resemblance to derevi by the yes. way because this is uh specifically and again i don't know why they did this they printed something on the card that makes it insane in commander yeah it's for it's a one a blue and a black for a one three you will never pay three for your go <laughs> you will pay two it's commander ninjutsu blue and a black return an unblocked attacker you control to hand put this card onto the battlefield from your hand or the command zone tapped and attacking sorry commander tax you don't exist nope it's two mana forever as yeah. long as you have a commander that is a, a card that is attacking and unblocked, unblocked yuriko yeah. is going to hit the battlefield so whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand each opponent loses life equal to that card's converted mana cost so that's the win con as well on the card you're flipping over 10 drops 12 drops draining everyone and just continually getting in for low chip damage too Yeah, Um, so this deck is full of tiny unblockable or evasive creatures, a lot of them with like little like ETB abilities, Mm -hmm. looping Baleful Strixes, looking Fairy Seers, looping... Oh gosh, that's uh, right. And 
and a lot of like the one mana unblockable ninjas. So like Changeling Outcast and Moth Dust Changeling could be a flyer. Yeah. Uh, will act as more ninjas to trigger Yuriko more and they're difficult to block. Yeah, not just that. I think uh, rogues count for a lot of stuff too. Trent Shore Stalker, again, mm-hmm. very good. Uh, and, and, and again, the ninja that's dealing combat damage is typically going to be Yuriko. It's it's usually only triggers once per turn. Yeah. Um, so Unless the, you have like a changeling outcast and something for Yuriko to just flash in, right? Right, which is possible. I've seen it trigger up to three times in a turn. Oh my and goodness. that was bad. Yeah. Uh, we took a lot of damage <laughs> that day. Uh, yeah, so how do you good. interact with a commander that's always two mana and their stuff is always unblockable and very low to the ground? We got to look at the ability and stop the ability from happening. And that means killing and picking off their little changeling outcasts and the cards that are going to give them the ability to commander ninjutsu in, which is tough mm-hmm. because they could be playing three to four of them and you don't have enough removal for all of those necessarily. Right. They're little and they're going to be returned to hand a lot of the time. You can never remove them in combat basically because yeah. Yuriko can be like <laughs> switched. You can like return like I'll use ninjutsu to return this one to my hand and then this one I'll use ninjutsu and it's going Yeah, and the bounce bell here and there. Yeah. So a good way to interrupt it is also to hit their top of library manipulation. Yeah. If they have a Sensei's Divining Top, obviously it's going to be very dr- tricky to get, rid of, get rid of. But if they have a scroll rack or something that's repeatedly scrying like a fairy seer, yep, yep, yep. Um, soothsaying will do this as well. Just make sure that they can't hit you with the most damage possible. <laughs> yeah, I think Yuriko decks are pretty... I mean, they are very powerful, but they they seem very linear. Whenever mm. I play one, it's pretty straightforward what's happening. So at the very least, you're not getting caught by surprise by a lot of things. So I think another easy way to try and beat the Yuriko deck is, hey, they're draining everyone around the table. You can use that to your advantage, and people are going to be playing in a different way because they're pressured as their life total goes down. You can pressure as well. You can try right. and kill the Yuriko player because they're trying to tap out. And they're trying to attack you with things, and they can't necessarily do so. To bl- they can't necessarily block if they're always attacking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, race them. Have the whole table start sending like your value creatures. Start hitting them with land or elves. Chip <laughs> away at the life total, and try and make sure that the whole table doesn't just die to yeah. Yuriko. So when in doubt, uh, merger. Yeah, easy to team up against Yuriko. I think player removal. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, stop trying to remove Yuriko. Hope it's not gonna happen. Yeah. Okay, this next one is also just insanely powerful, and I've seen it happen. You kill it, doesn't matter. They've got all the mana in the world to play it again. It's Urza, Lord High Artificer. Again, why? Why does this card exist? Yeah. Even when we first read it on the show, Josh and I were just kind of baffled. We were just like, this is just too much. It's, uh... it's too blue-blue for a 1-4, Human Artificer. Three abilities. Here we go. First ability. When Urza enters the battlefield, you create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token. With this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control. Cool. Sure. Second ability, tap an untapped artifact you control, add a blue mana. So that creature that came in, you can instantly tap it. It doesn't care if it has summoning sickness because this is a tap ability attached to a triggered or an activated ability. Mm-hmm. And then the last one, God knows why. Five mana, shuffle your library, then egg is on the top card until end of turn. You may play that card without paying its mana cost. So okay. that's just insane. It's very similar to a card that we had banned <laughs> as commander recently. Uh, the five, uh, five Kenan, drop of yeah. uh, yeah, Golos. Actually. Golos, sorry, yeah, Golos, not Kenan. Because yeah, he can uh, the last activated ability. But Urza is really similar to Kenan. It's Kenan's. very similar to Kenan. That's why I was thinking of Kenan. It's, Kenan is, ser- is similarly difficult to interact with uh, to Urza because mm-hmm. they both have this ability to give you more mana and then an infinite sink to put all of that mana into. Yeah. All of which can happen in response <laughs> to a removal spell. Yeah, and you can play Urza. Someone tries to kill it. You're like, cool, f- float all this mana by tapping these artifacts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Recast Urza. Recast Urza. What are you going to do? Nothing. Now they have two constructs. <laughs> yeah, two constructs. Even more <laughs> mana. And the fact that it doesn't care about you know summoning sickness, you're going to have a bunch of artifacts already in mono blue. The constructs themselves can also just kill people at a certain point. Mm. Urza's got it all. In Urza, a single package. It also just tends to be an infinite mana deck. Yeah. So removing it and and like chipping away at, at Urza is like they'll recast it. The deck is designed to have as much mana as possible mm-hmm. to spin Urza as many times as possible or sink it into some sort of infinite mana sink, like a like a staff of domination. Yeah. Um, Isochron Scepter, Dramatic Reversal. Yeah. All that good stuff. 
So, how do you interact with the mighty Urza? You concede. You, you go, I'm don't. done with this game. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have, so I had a friend who was new to Commander and he built Urza and he was like, it's Urza, it's it, it's Voltron Urza. Oh. And they're like, we're going to do Voltron Urza. Okay. And, and we're like, okay. And then he had Bloodforge Battle Axe and all the Bloodforge Battle Axe are tapped over mana and then you equip into Urza and now Urza's a 30-30 <laughs> and all of those tap our mana. You go on tap all the artifacts. It is still Urza. It's still Urza, it's yeah. It's still Urza. It's all still and, there. Like, you, they're like, it's budget Urza. It's still Urza. It's like getting... <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting into an F1 car and being like, nah, this is for NASCAR. I go the speed limit. Yeah. No, I'm you a 30 don't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Even if you accidentally press your toe down too hard, you've jumped to 100 miles an hour and you're like, well, I didn't know this was going to happen. There's That's there's Urza. no limitation that you can put on Urza that I believe that this card isn't overpowered. Um, yeah. Anyway, so how do you interact with them? It's it's like there are things you can do. You can pick off engine pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a big one. Getting rid of artifacts, vandal blasting them. Mm-hmm. Even then, they're still going to be able to recover, but they're not going to have their main source of extra mana because Urza yeah. depends on having that big board of other stuff to really start going off and getting all that value. Right. And it's like a Psy Master Thopterist. You're like, it makes Thopters. Who cares? They're mana rocks. They yeah, all sorry, they're mana rocks. Blue. Yep. So anytime you cast an artifact, you get an artifact means that you can just keep storming off there's like a mystic forge or something that lets you cast Mm -hmm. off the top of your library if they have enough mana to start spinning urza and casting off the top of their library anything that keeps the engine churning yeah like even traxos which taps for blue and then whenever you cast a historic spell it untaps oh so you just keep going you can just keep untapping traxos anything that draws cards like a vidalcan archmage whenever you cast an artifact you draw a card it's any these are making the engine stronger and stronger and stronger yeah i I think it wouldn't be as much of a problem if urza didn't have the win the game thing on him Mm -hmm. which is like if you have infinite mana you just pay five mana over and over again and you'll play the whole deck you're probably finding a way to win there or you've got you know yeah. your you know thoughts oracle or whatever so that's the danger of urza is that even if you slow it down it's still going to just jump back and bounce back so it's kind of one of those things where i think player focus similar to ninja mm-hmm. uh, similar to um yuriko and you just got to just focus on them take them down to the point where they have to play from a disadvantaged position mm-hmm. and as a result cannot just be willy-nilly being like oh, i'm just gonna do this and do this i'm at 35 i don't care what you do to me but i'm gonna generate so much value you can't beat me you got to put yeah. them in a place where they can't just go willy-nilly and have to be like shoot i Pressure. actually can't tap this construct because i need to hold up for blockers right and then the urza player is now disadvantaged if you can get them on the back foot that is where you want them and if you need to politic to get them there be like hey i'll swing all of my stuff this way i will send nothing your way yeah if you also just pull the get the guy yeah get urza out of here also urza just kind of a bad guy right he's like, yeah he's canceled yeah <laughs> <laughs> except in commander you can definitely still play him and we're still okay with you playing him too play him uh yeah just recognize that if you have an urza deck and even with the limitation on it it's still yeah it is still going to attract attention of the table and it deserves to it's extremely it's so powerful, powerful. and josh played it in his urtet deck yeah, and it yeah. was just the moment it landed, it instantly became the best card on the table, right. in the deck, and it did everything, right? I think I spent a removal spell on it. I was like, there's no way anything else is coming out of there. Like, the damage is done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, we can't just let it be there. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, it felt like the most ineffective removal spell ever. It's like Corval, already right? already tapped all of this. You try and kill it, but they've already been able to draw five cards off it. You right. try and kill Urza, but they've already tapped it and other things for 20 mana. Right. So it's like, cool, what did you really do other than stop them from, sl- like, even worse killing you or even right. worse winning the game at that You point. have to interact with them, but it, having a single target removal spell isn't necessarily going to be enough. So, uh, we talked about a lot of commanders today. Yeah, no kidding. A bunch of them. There, and many of them are new. Some of them are old. It's nice to see that, like, uh, that this, you know, some of the old classics are still cooking around and mm-hmm. still scary. Like, mm-hmm. Gitrog is still showing up, and Kalia is, is still Kalia can, will always be there. Still die to Narset? a Kalia whenever. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And we actually had to remove a lot of commanders from the list, too. There were plenty more that we wanted to talk about, like Kinnon, mm-hmm. uh, for instance. So, to the listeners, what commanders do you think are you're the most scared of, or your playgroup's the most scared of, and why? Why are they so scary? Is it the commander that maybe actually does? doesn't immediately pop into attention as like uh uh-oh watch out Mm -hmm. let us know why and also like what do you do to balance the scales around them how do you interact with them in the play group or is everyone just playing scary stuff 
you tell us maybe comment section all that good stuff you can find it all there and we always read those comments we see you on twitter as well so you know have your voice be heard we seem to have a very uh, i love the conversations that get going in the comment section too they're they're generally really healthy and, and there's a lot of cool back and forth yeah, I want to hear what you're afraid of in your playgroup. That's always a ton of fun. Uh, if you heard a commander that you like this episode, if you were like, you know what? That is scary. That I want to play Narset. That's me. And go to guardkingdom.com slash command to pick up those cards. They have a great selection of magic cards. So you can always find what you're looking for. They've mm-hmm. got this huge inventory. You can get it in the style, in the condition that you're looking for. So if you want to go more budget, you can get a, a little bit more of a banged up card. Card, yeah. still works just Definitely still the works. same you can still <laughs> die to a damaged urza good point um so yeah go to cardkingdom.com slash command and build a cool deck you can get it all in one package shows up on your doorsteps so you're only keeping track of one thing in the mail you're not going back through all of your orders and being like did i ever get this yeah what happened to the third copy of this i was looking i for? was like I, I feel like i'm missing something uh, it all comes at one time so you know that you get exactly what you paid for with card kingdom.com slash command yep and while you're done uh building that deck you're gonna want to sleeve it up keep it protected and put it on the cool play mat like this awesome uh in front of me is this amazing uh stitched play mat that ultra pro sells mm-hmm of Sneak Attack, one of my favorite cards of all time. That's yeah, a Wrath of God, Wrath I believe. Wrath of God. Um, my favorite card. <laughs> nice. Ultra what if, Pro. What if that was my favorite one? That would be kind of cool. Yeah. You love Mono White. I do. I do. Yeah. So ultrapro.com slash command is their website. That's our affiliate link. But when you're there, you're going to see tons of deals on products as well as brand new releases from Secret Lair Playmats and Arts to Sleeves. Uh, sometimes stuff goes out really quickly, especially for like the Transformers stuff. They had some Transformers Playmats that yeah, went out really, really quickly. Cool. But you can get those for sure at ultrapro.com slash command. Uh, you can sign up for their newsletter. And a lot of times stores don't carry the full suite of products. So between your LGS and ultrapro.com slash command, you're going to have everything you need to make your game area look awesome and super, super sweet. Uh, so that when we see you at MagicCon Minneapolis, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to be able to go, hey, check it out. Look at this. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You're so cool. We're cool. All of us are cool. <laughs> it's cool being cool together. <laughs> Thanks to ultrabro.com slash command. That's exactly how the conversation is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the cleanup step. We've got a huge team here at the command zone to say thank you to. So big thank you to Craig Lanchette, Damon Lentz, Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Jordan Bridge and Sam Waldo, Garav Galati, Jamie Black, Mitch Trafford, Evan Limberger, Gabriel Pozos, Megan Yep, Eric Lem, and Josh Lee Kwan. Holy moly, that's so many people. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone so much. And of course, thank you to the audience for paying attention, watching this episode all the way to the end. You're the best. You earn the gold star. That's right gold star coming to you right now you can put it on your favorite binder or magic card and put it in between the spokes of your wheels you know the bikes yeah that's the what gold that would do. star in your bike bus bike. it'll say from jimmy wong from jimmy wong yeah and it's an urza <laughs> <laughs> see you next time bye everyone For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>